this has been one of your most uh, like challenging dog that you've trained for. Oh, fuck. For someone that you're Huskies. like... Huskies. Like as a breed or like no. the job? <laughs> the job. Uh, well, I guess both. Yeah, yeah. It's a... Uh, the uh, husky is a weird creature, right? You know, it's always the hardest part is pet people because they believe that they're paying for a service. Like you go to Jiffy Lube and pay for your oil to be changed. You drive in there, your oil's changed, you drive away, that shit's supposed to do what it's supposed to do, right? It's not how it works with dogs. You know, they're a creature that wants to find their advantage and they're going to manipulate. Like the stuff we talked about last time, it's very hard for people to understand that the things we teach a dog, they're not unnatural, but they're, they're perishable. It's like diet and exercise, you know, like use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the dog. But the thing about the gym and the weights and things like that is like the weights aren't trying to manipulate you, right? So that's always the hard part. Like there's some situations where it's just not the right fit, you know, the right dog for the right house and the right home. So that's always the biggest challenge is teaching the average lay person how to connect and communicate with their dog and how to reinforce what we've taught. So that's always the, the big problem. The no matter what the breed, always, it's always nothing dog. No, it's, it's, it's probably why I've gravitated towards dogs because people are fucking difficult. Right? How long <laughs> do you work as a police officer? Seventeen years total. Did you love it? I did. I would have done it for free when we could do the job. But um, this big squeeze went on, and we we couldn't do our jobs after a while. And of course, like I mentioned, my lawsuits and shit like that. It was it was definitely time to go. But there was a point in my life where I would absolutely would have done it for free. I went in early, I left late, and you know, it was a big part of me that was compelled to to pay it forward and serve people. Mm -hmm. And I made a post about 9-11 the other day when we had that anniversary of 9-11 that I was really deep, deeply compelled and I wanted to become a cop to do those things. And especially when we went through 9-11, I was in the police academy when that the first plane hit the tower and, and after that and watching those folks run into those burning buildings, like it's just a huge compelling force like patriotic force to, to want to serve but i won't bullshit you either like i loved hunting criminals with my dog like <laughs> that was, that's really a, a huge compelling force as well like there's many factors but there's for me it might not sound like much to people that haven't lived that life but when it's out you and the dog hunting these armed criminals like that's some next level juice that i'm what does it feel like it's wild, you know, it's... It's just a connection, it's insane. He is your feet and your weapons, your eyes, your ears, he's your early. nose. He's... And the, when you, when you're right there with him. He's a, a truly your, your sensory mechanism out there in the dark, and you have to trust him, you know. But the thing about it is, like, you know, you, you put yourself in these situations, and a lot of times you don't think about it until after the fact. Like, there's been a lot of, a lot of close calls, man. I'm like, yeah, I should have died right there, <laughs> and I didn't. And it's God's grace, but it's... uh. It's, man, it's, it is like that adrenaline dump, you know? You kind of get addicted to that shit. I was addicted to the streets as much as the criminals, man. Just, you know, had a different, oh, a different agenda, you know? And, uh, you know, it's hard because like, I think we talked a little bit about the last podcast. Like, here in this county, they can do their job. Mm -hmm. It's changing, too. It's not like it was, you know, when I retired from South Florida, like, we were jealous of Martin County because they could do the job, you know? And the criminals know it. Like they'll do like an <laughs> arm. <laughs> no, they, they'll do an arm robbery in, in Palm Beach County, and they come north on ninety five. And just before they get into Martin County, will make a U turn. And, That's and, hilarious. And stay in Palm Beach County. But here's the difference now. Like now, several years ago, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, FHP changed their policy. Mm -hmm. They fucking pit everything. They smash. They play bumper cars. Like if you don't stop immediately, like right. you're going for a ride. <laughs> Right. So they chase everything. So and they and Palm Beach knows that. So like if there's some shit, because we can't chase anything. No, I mean, maybe a really violent murder suspect. But even then, they'll they'll bullshit and beg for FHP to come on the radio and, and let them handle all the shit, and we'll clean it up. Hmm. Well, it used to be me, not anymore. But it's a weird dynamic to the politics, man. So you know, long story short, that's it was a good time to leave when I did. So. That's that, really. What do you do for relaxing time when you're not? I have a hard time relaxing. I have a hard time relaxing, and that's it's been a toxic trait, like character flaw. <laughs> um, you know, I love what I do, so it's not like it's work. Right. You know, I love the dogs. It's it's a grind at times. Like the travel gets to be grind. Like 
and kind of to circle back to answer your question, like my main thing right now is to really provide an online training platform mm -hmm. um, as well as an in-person, um, but to, to travel less and have folks come to me, like to have an in-person dog training school up, up near Knoxville. Um, I do really enjoy, I've been very blessed to travel a lot, see this country and meet some amazing people and incredible dogs, but it's, it's a grind, you know? So with this new year coming, um, things slow down for me in November and December, I'm trying to leave a complete, well, I picked a one, two day class and just a few hours for me in North Carolina, but I'm trying to do less, you know, be home more. And I have a girl that works with me, her name's Rebecca. She's phenomenal. She's a really great trainer and she's amazing. Oh, I her. She's yeah, awesome. She's yeah. awesome. She's, she's great. So I, I can, I can go away and she can take care of everything, maintain the dogs and, oh, wow. and talk to the clients and help that's my wife. Phenomenal. Yeah, no, it's really great. Wow. Really great. That's great. True blessing. So I've been through a lot of shit. Like I had a, a larger facility, multiple employees, bigger is not better, you know? Yeah. So about a year ago, we, we downsized everything to my house and just, I outsourced. I have a couple, two, two other trainers that are both canine handlers for agencies near me. They're phenomenal trainers, good, really good people. So they take dogs home. So I'm, I'm really trying to put my hands on dogs less and, and teach more people. That's awesome. Yeah, it's pass on the knowledge. That's the plan. So we'll see. But then, we, like I said earlier, I'm not, I don't have the business mind. So I'm, I'm collaborating with some folks. Do you follow American Standard Canine? Yes. So Garrett Wing, who runs that business, owns that. He's a former canine guy from the city of Miami. And we've known each other many years. And... We're going to start collaborating on, on some things and he's got a massive massive platform a huge footprint in the industry so um he's really created an amazing business model mm -hmm. um, he's connected with millions of pet owners that and is awesome so he probably has five six million followers across all platforms and uh, so what he the part that he wants to expand into is the train the trainer so he's doing it already he's already training people that want to learn how to train dogs mm -hmm. But that's that's kind of where my little niche has been is training the trainer. The other, you know, the professional dog trainer wants to know more and do more. That's kind of where I've had my little footprint in. So we're kind of going to merge those worlds together and I think build something real special for sure. So the training encyclopedia. Yeah, training. The dog training yeah. encyclopedia. And I, I between the two of you, I'm sure you can come up with some kind of uh, pretty cool book. Or, yeah, and I've I've been approached about writing, but like I can't. I, I have a learning disability. Like I, I can write okay, but I can't retain anything I read. But I had somebody approach me recently again um, that wants to do a book, like hire a ghostwriter and just let me bleh, <laughs> a diary of the mouth, and like, <laughs> write it down and then put it in a way like. So there may be something like that in the future too. Like, and it's not something I really had an interest in because again I can't retain anything I read so it's not how I learn but I think it's something important for folks to you know. get something to have like an ebook yeah and, yeah well you have a YouTube channel and you have tons of information there too I put a lot of shit out there um, but it's you know me throwing up my phone and I just recently got mics and a little bit decent camera like a little bit nice cameras like you got and try to make it more uh, user friendly and, and to capture that that ADD on social media, like you have like two seconds to grab somebody, you yes. know, or this, the swipe culture, you're, they're gone. Yes, it's, yeah, I mean, it's weird because sometimes you think this is going to be great, and it's like, oh, my God. Flops. I love it, but nobody else did. And then, like, and then you're driving, you're like, ah, fuck it, I'll, throw, I'll put that up just to feed the algorithm. And then, wow, and exactly. what the hell? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, I put this stupid video together about how to fold up a leash roll it up and throw it in your bag so it doesn't get tangled and it went like kind of viral right that's funny and i'll put some brainiac shit down like <laughs> this is like some deep in the woods dog training maybe shit. maybe it's and, brainiac kind of full of leash and nobody gives a fuck about it apparently they do <laughs> well, about the leash they did but like other dog training stuff they didn't so so um let's talk about the e-collar um there's a lot of people that have this negative um perception yeah. of the e-collar yeah. but um the way you presented it we talked about it sure on our last time you were here um yeah. how can you explain it like if you're explaining it to like a five-year-old kid or yeah. your grandma and we're both sitting there what is an e-collar yeah. and what are the goods and the bads about it if there was a five-year-old sitting there and a grandma sitting there i'd be like i would say grandma 
Would you like to have the ability to, when he's running around and not listen, to have something in your hand where you could have him come back to you and uh, comply and listen and be pretty happy, be ha but, uh, but be happy about it, right? Granny would say, give me it, give me it right now. Because you know, those kids, they just don't listen. So what the e-call really is, it's a tool. And, and any tool in a toolbox can be a magical kind of unicorn type of thing, or it could be a destructive conflict-based thing where the dog's gonna be like stressed out, it's gonna be scared, it's gonna be conflicted. You know, you know you're you're Latin, right? So do you use your flip flop like as a chakla? That, <laughs> yeah, my dogs know. <laughs> so flip flop is designed to be comfortable. This is and... my <laughs> but it's like anything in your hand. It's it's in the interpretation of the user and the hands of the beholder how you utilize that tool. So we demonize the e collar, but you know people are driving cars, right? How many times do people get killed in car wrecks? And do we, do we blame the vehicle? Do we blame the tool itself, the engine, the transmission? No. No, it was that bitch. Yeah, well, it's the Coming human off. behind the wheel, yeah. not paying attention or driving too aggressively, whatever the factor is. So it's again, it's the human behind the tool, which is gonna dictate the outcome and whether it's gonna make sense to the dog. So quite simply, it's, it, it is God's gift to dog trainers and owners. It really has the ability to reach out and communicate with a dog at great distances at the speed of sound. And if we can implement a system that makes perfect sense to the dog, where they're happy about it, right? And you have to understand that a dog learns through association. Like they don't have the ability to rationalize or reason like a human being. My ex-wife would tell you that I don't, I don't either have the ability to rationalize or reason, <laughs> but we know that dogs don't. Like they connect dots. They can make inferences. Like they're the more deep into dog training, a dog training system a dog gets, it's almost like high school, college, master's degree, doctor, like they start to really open up dimensions of their brain where they, they really can think on another level. And their memories are incredible, but we have to have a system where it makes sense to the dog and we can communicate in their native language and their mother language. So if I have an e-collar out and the dog's never ever had it in our life, like the dog, it's a blank slate, they have no idea what the collar means, I can make the dog really, really addicted to the collar like begging to shove their head in it, right? And again, forgive me if we, we talk about things that are from babbling and, and saying the same stories over no, and no, over. No, no, I like it. But like if most pet owners, like your own personal dogs, we're creatures of habit. Normally we keep the leash in an easy to find location. By the door, we take the dogs out. Um, and dogs are reading us like a book, right? They're, oh, they're, God, yes. So if you, when you start walking towards your front door, to take the dog for a potty break and if you use a leash to walk your dog when you grab that leash what's the response on the oh dog? it's happy they time. go crazy mm -hmm. they go ballistic they're spinning they're barking they cannot wait because through association they've linked when that piece of equipment goes on really good things happen things that they perceive as enjoyable and are very fulfilling right and going for a walk is very fulfilling for a dog so they get to sniff and bark and pee and poo and be dogs right and the analogy i use for that is like us being on social media them peeing and pooing and barking is like, like liking, sharing, commenting, <laughs> fucking blocking people, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, that we have to talk about. Yeah. I, I need one of those shirts. Yes, yeah, yeah. Pablo Esco logo. That was, that was good. <laughs> you know, the social media tried to block that. They tried to. Stop! Yes, they, they tried to block your block? They, yes, they said it went against community standards. <laughs> Pablo Esco block. Stop! <laughs> yes. And I appealed it and they let it back. But by the time it came back, like. You cannot make this shit No, I'm telling you. Oh, you had to appeal it? I guess because I thought I was like supporting the cartel or whatever. They have the freaking thingy yeah, on their stuff. That's where I found it. That's Popped dope. up on CapCut. Cap, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, long story short, when a dog goes outside, it's like party time. And they've connected, linked together that the leash starts that party. I can do the exact same thing with an e-collar. And we call it classical conditioning, like not get too deep in the woods about dog psychology, but with classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning, we've all heard that study of, uh, of Pavlov where they, they ring the bell and the dogs start to drool, right? And that's a, it's an old study and it was never even intended to create what it did, but what it, long story short is that dogs can link things together, link signals together. like. One thing can have an incredible amount of meaning, like the leash, right? The leash means party time, as, as I explained. But the e-collar, if the dog's never had it on, has no value to the dog. So we call that a neutral stimulus with a known stimulus. And that's what classical conditioning is, where the dog links those two things together. 
So in order for us to create the party for the e-collar, we have to introduce the e-collar and then within one and a half to two seconds, put the leash on. Like with associative learning, with conditioning, okay. it's a very short amount of time. Like I can't put the e-collar on and go, shit, where do I put my keys and my phone? And, and then five minutes Ooh, later, the dog, lo you lost it. Just like when dogs you know, have an accident in the house, they do number one or number two, they pee or poo, they poo. If you come in the house and, and it, it was 20 minutes ago where the dog dropped a big old steamer on the rug, you can't punish them. Like that, <laughs> in, the, in the old school thing, if you grabbing a dog's nose and shoving it in there, like they think you're disgusting and gross. Like they have <laughs> no idea why you're doing it. What the fuck? Exactly, right? Like this fucking idiot, like he's filthy. Unless the dog's weird and like, like the Frenchies love to eat shit. Like some of my Frenchies, it's, it's like a buffet. <laughs> you're disgusting fucks. So they're probably like, ooh, you're into what I'm into. Like, so, fucking some puppy shitty kink kind of shit. What the fuck? <laughs> they're fuck disgusting. And then they make this like powdered shit, right? They put shit to put in the food. Like, what can you put in food to make shit smell and taste worse than shit? Like, I, right? So how, I don't fucking. Did it work? It's Did a you marketing. try it? No, well, that shit doesn't work. It's you some, should just try it. It's some marketing gimmick shit. It's just made it more flavorful to the French. The, the, they're fucking gross. Oh, stay safe, pink. It's great. Anyway. Wow. But, that's crazy. So, yeah. So the dogs, they link things together, like neutral signal to a known signal. So what we would do is I'd hang an e-collar by my front door right next to the leash. Let's say we're using like a coat hook. Like there's a leash on the coat hook. Now I take the e-collar where the dogs again never had it. Put the e-collar on. I would I would kind of buckle it together so it's like a hoop, right? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get over the dog's head and grab the leash and go. I don't want to sit there just buckling it and the dog's like, hey, dummy. You didn't grab the leash, you grabbed yeah. something else. Like, that's what's going to happen. You're going to grab the e-collar, and they're going to be like Stevie Wonder trying to juke that shit. Be like, no, dummy, grab the leash. Right. But you'll get it on their head, and they'll be like, all right. And then you grab the leash, and you go. So through time and repetition, e-collar, leash, e-collar, leash. Before you know it, the dog's going to be like, e-collar, e -collar, put it on, because it means leash. And you can also create these games with anything that the dog, um, you can predict that the dog loves. Like, again, it has to be the dog's perception. It has to be something the dog loves, whether it's going to go play a Frisbee or you take it to, you know, a park or you take it to the beach. Like, any event where the dog has, like, this, like, heightened enhancement of excitability, you want to connect the e-collar to that moment, right? And, again, when, you, when dogs come in for board and train, we're kind of always pressed for time. So this is something like the pet dog owner can do on their own. Let's say they want the dog to go into training, um, but it's you can you can do this homework long before the dog ever understands anything about training because we want the dog to love the tools. Like that's really the most important thing. If the dog looks at the tool as like an electric chair around their neck, it's going to kill them. Okay. They're forever going to be like suppressed. They're going to be um, hesitant, scared to make decisions. Like you want a dog wide open, making choices, making decisions. But again, having a training system that teaches them exactly what we're looking for. So we want to make good feelings of the equipment. And it's really stupid simple that, you know, we have to really dumb it down in our own brain because it's, again, it's a creature that learns through black and white. So e-collar party, e-collar party. There's a lot of different ways to do that. If you have like food kind of training sessions with your dog and they get very excited to do that, they see you loading up your pouch with food and they know exactly what time it is, right? E-collar. Play your clicker games with food. Like you don't even have to push the button yet. Even that it's a three-step process for me. That first step, making him love the equipment. We don't even push buttons. I don't even care if the thing's charged. I want the presence and the actual the dress rehearsal, putting the collar on for the dog to love it, just to love it. And that takes time. You're looking at a few weeks for the dog to start linking that whole thing together. So once the dog, like if I grab the e-collar, the dog's like, oh, give me that shit. Then we know we're ready for step two. And what step two looks like is that when I actually do touch the button on a super, super low level, like a level that you and I couldn't even feel, like the main company that I work with or use their, their e-collar is called e-collar technologies. Okay. And they have all different types of models um, for like basic little pet stuff all the way up to like hardcore working dog stuff. Um, so I'll take that device, the, the number one collar I use for most, like I would say 90% of pet dogs is what they call the mini educator. It's just a very user-friendly device, and um, this it's on. I can't feel like it goes up to zero to a hundred, 
I put the e collar on my hand. I can't really feel it till about 12, right? And I'm like, yeah, I think I can feel that. It's just like a little tickle. It's not even like a TENS unit yet. Like if you've, you've had TENS units, like on physical therapy or the chiropractor, oh. yeah, that's if you crank it up. Um, and I've, I've been in some bad car wrecks before and bad sports injuries. I've been in a walker before because of my back before. A TENS unit actually got me vertical again. Like wow. they're, they're a miracle, they're miraculous. But long story short, it's, it's a device that's gonna deliver like a little bit of that tickling or pulsating sensation like a TENS unit. Now every manufacturer of e-collar is a little bit different, so they all have a different patent on the way the collar stimulate, like Chevy's motor is different than Ford as a whole, but they all make sense to the dog if you do it the right way. So, so imagine the dog can't wait to have a piece of equipment on. So they're like, put that e-collar on me, that's step one. Now step two, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna touch a button on a super low level, it's like a little tickle that maybe we can't even notice that the dog even feels it, but I give them so much credit for their senses. I believe, like they, I believe when you push a button on an e-collar, like the mechanics start working, I believe they can smell that. If you put an e-collar up to your ear and you push a button, you can almost hear like the contact points, yeah, a little vibration. So I believe they can hear it, they can smell it, they can feel it on super low levels. I, I know that their senses are so acute. So again, we're staying on a level that's like, so like, almost we think they can't even register because again, we're gonna take our time. So when the dog's in a situation where they're motivated for something, let's say food, right? I have my pouch full of food. I'm in an environment where they know training's about to happen. The collar's on, I'm gonna touch a button, which has no meaning to the dog whatsoever, a little scratch, and then I'm gonna give them food. A little scratch, give them food. Now, as I mentioned before, there has to be like a one and a half to two second separation. Like you can't throw the leash and the collar on at the same time. There has to be the separation for classical conditioning to occur. So it has to be e-collar, one 1,000 leash. It's the same thing with the food. So I'm gonna touch the button. And if I'm simultaneously touching the button and offering food, the dog's gonna be fixated on the movement of my hand. And we call that gestural communication and also tactile communication. Like if they can feel it, they can touch it, they're gonna be fixated on that movement. And this is the, the feeling of the collar will be lost for a moment. So again, we want no, like our hands can be empty. We're sitting there like a statue, touch the button. The dog's like, hey, I feel something. And then dummy reaches in the pouch and gives me food. So tap the button, reach in the pouch, give food. Tap, reach, deliver. Then over time, the dog starts to link, hey, that sens sensation means food. Or I could touch the button and throw their favorite toy. Touch the button, throw their favorite toy. And what's gonna happen, especially dogs that like to play ball, or even like police dogs or working dogs that like to bite, like people wear the big suit or the padded sleeve. When a dog has that real deep desire to go after prey, they have endorphins and adrenaline flowing through their veins. Just like the same hormonal uh, secretion that you and I have when we're jacked up to do things. So if I can link the sensation of an e collar to that like endorphin response, like that runner's high, the dogs, we can, they'll over time, when you touch the button, they're gonna have that like invigorated feeling. It's conditioning. Like, whether they, we condition a word that we say, like sit or down, or a tactile feeling like the e collar, or the dog smells cocaine if he's a drug dog, like this, we can condition all the senses, right? So if we can keep conditioning an e-car that we tap the button and they think their toy's coming out, that's ideal. Because later, what's gonna happen, we're preparing the dogs for pressure. Like there's always pressure. I do my best work under pressure. Like there's pressure amongst the pack. Like you're saying your babies at 17 days old are fighting already. Like <laughs> yes. They're teaching each other the language of life. You know, this is puppy little MMA. They're just scrapping, they're wrestling, but they're teaching each other letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, stories, books, chapters. Like, they're teaching each other the language of life. And it, part of that language is managing discomfort and conflict. And as you know, breeding, at some point in time, mom is going to say, it's Yes. Finito. All right. It's, it's over. <laughs> teeth it off. Yes. You guys are done. The yeah. milk's drying up. Their teeth are like needles, and Oof. it's starting to hurt mama. The little gremlins. Yes. And what does mama pick them up and go, hey, buddy. No. <laughs> Whack. Right? Yeah. So nature, God's hardwired predators and survivors to understand how to manage pressure. There's no dog trainer on earth that gave them that, that language. We didn't, we didn't sit a puppy down and say, hey, I'm a dog trainer. You're a dog. This is how you shut off pressure. When a sperm hit the egg and those little paws hit the ground, they took their first breath, like they're starting to understand how to manage pressure. And our role and responsibility as the dominant species on the earth is, is to create a training system with our communication, with our tools that teaches a dog clearly how to shut off pressure. 
Because what's going to happen over time is that at some point in time in a dog's life, they're going to make mistakes. Dogs make very bad choices, and they don't understand that running across I-95 can get them killed. All they see is a cat running first. They're running behind the cat, and the cat somehow has nine lives and gets between the cars, but maybe not always the dog does. So also when dogs are hypervigilant when they're chasing prey, mm -hmm. the ears are shut off. We call that auditory exclusion. It happens in humans. Like we're, we're fixated on a task. We, we can't always hear, especially guys. Like women have a very good ability to multitask. I'm a one dimensional creature. Like, especially if I'm editing. If I'm editing something, like I can't hear nothing, right? But if it's the same thing with a dog, if they're pursuing prey, like the ears are shut off. They're so fixated on grabbing that cat or that rabbit or that deer that they may go across a busy street and God forbid, get hit by a car. So the e-car can allow you to reach out and touch the dog at the speed of sound, at a level that makes the dog go, uh, they're calling me because they can feel the collar. Their ears may not be working, but mm -hmm. they will absolutely feel that. And you can override that endorphin, the adrenaline kick that they're feeling trying to kill that rabbit by make them come home by speaking through the e-collar. Now, that's a uh, really extreme situation, right? Most of the time, we're, we're ideally not using the collar much at all. But it does, the dog feels the equipment on their neck. They understand that that's in play. Like through the progression of training, when the dog loves the equipment, we've charged stimulation as I spoke about in step two. Step three is simply uh, attaching that low level tickle to a behavior that we've taught the dog. Like say place, for instance, we've taught the mm -hmm. dog to go to a cot. We've taught the dog to sit, to down, to come when called and heal. The dog loves it during motivation. Um, we have a reward system. The dog understands training. What we're simply going to do is overlay, combine the e-collar with that exercise the dog knows. Now, let's say this is a place cot, right? And the dog loves to go on place. A lot of times, uh, every dog that I train, if they're not super nervous or weird, like most dogs love going to place because it's one of the first exercises I do. They realize they get rewarded with food up there. It's just a party, right? That's a spot. A lot of dogs love going to big fluffy beds and hanging out anyway. So with my clicker and my food, I create a lot of repetition history of the dog loving place and then getting paid there. Simply when I know that they want to go to place, I just add that low level tickle, tap, tap, tap. It's like this continuous little pulsating sensation. As the dog arrives on place, that little sensation stops and I give them the reward. So the dog's like, this is awesome. Like I, I feel this, it stops, I get there, I get paid. But now we start to add a little distraction, whether it's another dog, it's a person, maybe even a little piece of food that I'm rewarding them with. Like I'll put the food over there, but I want them to go to place. They're gonna be like, ooh, it's easy. Mm -hmm. It's low hanging fruit, I could steal that. And then with my e-collar, I can slowly go tick, tick, tick. I can put it up a little bit higher so they go, oh, okay, you're talking to me, right? Mm -hmm. So you start adding control distraction. And the, the beauty of the modern systems of e cars is that we can lo lower and raise stimulation based on the dog's drive state, based on the decisions that they're making. And just have that little sensation that says, ah, the human's talking to me, I better go in this direction. So I know how to turn that off, but that I know that I can still get paid. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of both worlds that we teach the dog how to really clearly shut off pressure and then ultimately stay away from it. Like to stay in their lane, understand the behavior we're asking. But every now and then they're going to make those bad decisions that we have the ability to make sense of them in that moment to shut off that pressure. But, the, you know, the main thing with an e-collar is that we want to have that tool as an insurance policy. It's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So as we go through a training system, we want to cl clearly educate the dog on how to use it. But we don't want to be living on the button. Right. It's right. Just, we just want to have it accessible in case the dog makes those bad decisions. Or... Again, I was a cop for a, a pretty long time, and because there's there's human beings that know the law, but like there's a good percentage of the population that understands the law, they're still gonna break it. They don't give a shit because they're criminals, right? Okay. They don't care what cops come and what dogs come and what badge, what tank, what bazooka's coming to grab them. They're still gonna commit crimes. Well, here's the deal, there's dogs like that. <laughs> there are dogs like that that know what's gonna happen if they do a certain behavior. We're still going to go for it. We know people like that, right? Yeah. There's dogs like that. So not every dog is this huggy, little kissy, compliant thing. There's there's dogs that are assholes. <laughs> and there's really? dogs that, that want to fucking hurt people, hurt other dogs, and destroy your property, and, and engage in behavior that's going to kill them. Like, if a dog comes in here, there's thousands of dollars of equipment. There's electrical cords they can eat and chew. Like, yeah. There's, there's dog again, they'll make bad decisions that can kill them. 
So I'm very willing to create a training system and use tools that will stop dogs or make them make decisions um, that could save their lives. Really, it's, and it's nature. Yeah. And there's, there's a portion of the dog training community that believes you can only train a dog with just cookies and treats. It's bullshit. It's a, it's a money grab. So the dog understands again how to shut off pressure, but we just have to be responsible and fair and clear on how we communicate that to the dog. So, so ultimately, it's yeah, there are dogs with bad behavior. But so uh, if they're all good, I'd be homeless. Be I, I owners, have a job. owners, <laughs> it's the owners basically. It's a lot of times, yeah, yeah, a lot of times it is. But it, you know, if, if people knew how to train dogs and how to communicate, again, I'd be homeless, right? So it's, yeah, <laughs> good thing they don't.